Uh, hi everyone, I'm Keith. Uh, today we're going to be talking about DigiDP. Okay. So you know, in DigiDP, we have some sort of range that we care about. For, uh, for now, we're going to consider from 0 to A, a range of integers. Okay. Um, and we have some predicate, which is a function that takes in a number and returns either true or false. Um, and in DigiDP, this predicate usually deals with either the actual digits of the numbers themselves, um, or maybe their mods remains or something, and stuff like that, right? Um, uh, and then the uh, other thing we have is some sort of function, which is usually either the count or the sum. 99% um, yeah, of times will just be the count of stuff, but it can also be like adding up digits or adding up the numbers themselves or stuff like that. Um, and the idea in GDP is you want to look at all numbers in this range that satisfy this predicate and then add them up or count them or something like that. Okay. Um, and the reason you can't actually just do that, no matter how fast this predicate is, is because these ranges are usually really, really big. So in most chord forces problems that deal with the DP, they'll either be like 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 18th, um, much bigger than you can do linearly. Um, and in some ITPP problems, uh, it can be even bigger than that. It can be um, uh, bigger than you can represent in, in a normal int or long long. It can be you know, like 100 digit numbers or 1,000 digit numbers or anything. So we really just want a login solution to these sort of problems, right? Okay. Now, to start off, we're going to look at a very trivial example, okay? Um, and that's given this number a, given our range, we just want to uh, print the number of non-negative integers less than or equal to a. So obviously, there is an easy solution to this, which is the answer is just a, right? Just return a. Um, However, we don't want to do that because we want to explore the idea of DDP. So I'm, I'm sort of cutting away all the extra stuff and showing how DDP actually works for this very, very simple case. Um, okay. So as the name may indicate, we're going to do DP on these digits, right? So we're going to look at uh, the the index of which digit we're at our number. We're going to try to construct a number, and we're going to do that using DP. Okay. So at every DP state, uh, it'll be like DPI, right? And the i, or position, will be where we are in the number. So we've constructed the number up to that position i, and we're going to look at constructing the number from then onwards. So if you look at this uh, example here, right, if a is this number, right, x is an example of we've constructed these first three guys, and the dp will be at this position, 4, or x is 0 and x will be 3. So that's how the dp will look. We'll try to construct the number from left to right, okay, from most significant to least significant. Um, so the important thing to notice here is that um, if we've gone below some digit a in the past, uh, so below below like the, the digit that is in a sometime in the past, um, then we have complete freedom. We can do whatever we want. So for example, if you look at x here, right? If the number we've constructed so far matches a here, it matches a here, but it's one below a here, then we can do whatever the heck we want for these two digits, right? Even if you make them 999, They'll still be below a because that's how numbers work, right? Think, uh, numbers, that's the way numbers work, right? Because we this two is less than three, so we can do whatever we want for these two digits, right? Otherwise, if we haven't gone below, so for y we've sort of mashed a, right? One, two, three. Then in the DP we can't uh, do whatever we want. We have to keep like restricted below by this four, five, six part. Uh, does everyone see what I'm saying here? Uh, I'll explain more on how the DP works in a second, but. Does everyone see what I'm what I mean by how like restricting the number by a, a works? Okay. Um, yeah. So so here for this this digit d whatever that d is going to be has to be less than or equal to four. Uh, unlike here where it can be up to nine or whatever we want. Right. Okay, so so this is this sort of idea. So then uh, what we want to do is we can do a DP on this. We can do a DP not only on which position we're on, but also on whether or not we're constrained. And that turns out to be all the information we need for this problem. Okay, so look at the implementation. We have uh, DP of position, because this is up to like 10 to the 18th or whatever, right? So 20 digits is more than enough to hold all our information. Um, and then we have two, whether are we constrained or are we not constrained? Right? Have we gone below sometime in the past, or have we not gone below sometime in the past? Um, and so uh, R here is the sort of representation of the number. So you just make the number a string, basically, and write it out. And N is the length of the number, the length of A, number of digits in A. Okay. And then we do a DP on that. So DP, as I said before, is the position and whether or not we're equal. Um, and then 
uh, if we if we're at the end, we just return one. If, if we fix the full prefix, the prefix the entire number. If we fix that, there's no more slots for us. There's only one number that works that way. If we filled out, if remember a was like one two three four five six, if we filled in I don't know one 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 six times. There's only one digit that has that as a prefix, right? So that's it. We're done. There's only one number that works. Otherwise, right? Uh, we loop through all possible digits. So what are the possible digits we can take? So if we're not constrained, right, then we can go from 0 to 9, right? So it's 0, 9 here, right? If we're not constrained. But if we are constrained, we go from 0 to whatever the position is in A. And then we look at, okay, now we're going to fix that number in our prefix, and then see how many numbers there are who work with that from, from that prefix onward. So we push one forward. And we say, okay, the only way we'll be constrained in the future is if we're constrained right now, and we still matched A, we didn't fall below A. So this is the only, this, this and gives away the our constraint right now. And so that gives a number of numbers that work for this case, this DP state, and then we add that to our current guy. Um, and, and by the way, if you haven't seen this sort of stuff before where, have, where I do this, that's just checking with negative one or not. Um, and so then, uh, if we have this DP thing, then the answer uh, will just be solve zero one because why we're starting we haven't fixed anything we're about to fix the first slot the first number the first digit um, and we are constrained right now because the first digit has to be less than the most significant digit in NA right if, if A starts with one then the only possible option for your actual number is going to be zero and one uh, so so this way we can sort of construct the number forward. Any questions? So everyone's good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is this is the DP thing for uh, this very simple problem. Uh, of course, uh, for more complicated problems, you'll have more more information and more stuff. Uh, but this is still the basic template you're going to be using for ZDP. Okay, uh, I have this in my uh, good code file, my, my uh, template file, um, and this is the basic structure of how ZDP works. You want to keep, you, no matter what you do for ZDP, you'll need to keep track of this prefix, wh which position you are in the prefix, and whether or not you're constrained right now. And so, uh, this will most DP problems will look these two DP problems will look pretty similar to this. Okay. Okay. So this is first. Now let's the complexity of this. Uh, this is log n time, right? Because we have log n digits. Uh, the complexity of this is just number of states, is just how many digits we have, like twenty or eighteen or whatever, and that's just log base ten of our number, right? Um, and one thing to note is, what if instead of zero to a, we want the 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 amount of numbers in the range a to b instead, or the amount of numbers that satisfy this prefix, this predicate p of x in the range a to b? Uh, well, this is a very simple solution for that. We just take from zero to b minus 0 to a, as minus 0 to a minus 1, right? Like this. Because then we'll have everything up to b, and anything below a will get lost. Um, and now as we go to do more complicated problems, which actually have a predicate or some counting function or something, more than counting or anything, we can keep that sort of information in that dp. We can keep the information we need to calculate that in our dp state. And sort of the struggling to the DP is figuring out a way a nice representation of the DP state such that uh, we can A, calculate this, these functions that we need, but B, still have the DP state remain small and compressed enough so that we don't go out of time limit. So it still is like polylog time, polylog space. Okay, so now we're going to look at an actual example that's not trivially solvable. Okay. And so the example is that we want to count the number, the numbers in this range a to b, where the sum of the digits of that number add up to k. Right. So k is a given parameter. So let's say um, k is like I don't know five, five, right? And the number one one uh, one one three, right? One hundred thirteen would add up to five. Its digits don't want to add to five, but one one fourteen it would add up to six and not five. So you wouldn't count that one, but you would count one hundred thirteen thousand range. Okay. So here, a and b again are 10 to 18, so they're really, really big. Uh, you can't actually look through it. And k is, let's say, less than equal to 100. Okay. So 
Any ideas on this? Yes, exactly. The information to calculate the predicate that we need here, or the predicate, by the way, here is that the sum of digits has to equal k. The, all the information that we need is the sum of digits. We literally just need the sum of the digits and check whether that equals k, right? So that's the information we need. Um, and just to check, make sure, will that grow too big, right? Maybe this is too much information to be, to go out of time limit, but you can easily see that it's not because the sum of the digits only grow up to max nine times the number of digits, right? Every digit at most can be nine. That's the biggest digit you can have. Um, and if it's 10 to the 18th, you have like 18 digits at most. And like nine times, I don't know, 20, uh, is what is that? That's 180. So that's definitely small enough, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and maybe, uh, uh, yeah, that's and another thing to keep to sort of, if you, even if that was too big, another thing to realize here is that k is small, right? k is up to 100. So if it ever goes past k, you can just make it equal to k. Uh, we don't need to do that in this case because the max sum only goes below 200, right? So there's no point. But if, if let's say, uh, this information was going too big, maybe, you could maybe keep it constrained by what k was. This is kind of a nice thing to realize. It doesn't matter if it ever goes, what it actually is if it goes past k. Okay? Right, yeah. So we add a state to the DP, which represents the current digit sum. Um, and then we can update this because we literally just pick the digits. That's what the DP is. We're picking the actual physical digits. So we can just add that to our sum. Okay. And so this is how the code looks like. Notice it's almost exactly what we had before. There's only like three changes. First change is that I add this extra state to our DP, the extra axis. Right. And as I said before, it goes to 200 because like, I don't know, 180, 9 times 8, 20 is 180. Um, and then the predicate here, instead of returning the equals one here, uh, once we fix the entire number, once we fix the entire prefix of the entire number, right, prefix that is the entire number, um, we only take it when, if the sum is actually equal to k, if the digit sum is equal to k. Um, final, final small change here is that we actually need to update the sum, and that we do that just by literally adding the digit. And, and that's it. And so to get the actual answer, you would call solve 0, 1, 0. Because start at position 0, we are constrained on the most significant digit, and the digit sum starts out at 0. Uh, okay, so now actual problems. So yeah, the lecture is pretty short, but I think it's more important rather than sh like lecturing you about techniques to just show you how to use a bunch of like techniques to adapt to GP to these different techniques um, to do problems. Okay. Well, first problem is called investigation. This is going to be very similar to our last problem. It'll just sort of build on top of it. Okay. So we want the number of integers in the range a to b, which are a both divisible by k and the sum of its digits is also divisible by k. Um, here again, uh, a to the b are big. In this case, it's not 10 to the 18th, it's 10 to the 9th. Uh, that's just how the problem had it. Um, and k goes up to 10,000. Okay? So as an example, we can look at number 300, 3720. Uh, this is divisible by 3. And the sum of its digits is also divisible by 3. Because the sum of the digits is 12, which is also divisible by 3, right? So, so um, maybe you guys can think about what information you'll need to calculate uh, whether or not this condition is true, right? What information you need to, to calculate, that's a store or maintain, to calculate whether it's divisible by k and whether someone is also divisible by k, right? What is the information you need for that?
Yeah, exactly. Uh, same with the other problem, except we also need the DP parameter for the remainder mod k. Um, and so instead of storing just the actual value and then checking what is divisible by k at the end, we can keep the DPK small by just modding by k every time. Now let's keep it compressible. Right? And so when we're adding the digit to this, right, in a physical transition state, the way we add it is by multiplying the remainder by 10, the, the old remainder, right? Because we're, if we have a prefix, right, and that's the value, mod k, we're going to shift it once to the left, which is multiplying by 10, and then we add the new digit to it, and then mod the entire by k again, right? So that, that's what adding a digit to a number means. We shift it to the left, which is multiplied by 10, and then plus d. So in terms of complexity, what do we have? We have log n, which is the number of positions we have, times the maximum possible sum, which is also log n, by the way, as we discovered before, because the maximum possible uh, digit sum, right, is going to be just the 9 times the number of digits, so that's also log n, and then times k, because the mod k only goes as big as k. So then it becomes log the squared nk, which is this, which is only around a million. So that's small enough. Uh, so now we can look at the code, and, and again, this is very similar to the last problem. Only thing we've done is we've added an extra thing here, an extra state for the remainder mod k, um, and then we've added for parameters. So here, in the dp state, we only take this guy when the digit sum is divisible by k, and the remainder mod k is also zero, which means the actual value is divisible by k. And then finally, when we're transitioning, we add to the, to the sum, to the digit sum, and we do that shifting formula from before. Does that make sense? Wait, by the way, yeah? If the remainder is greater than the maximum, it's just like automatically return to zero. So then like, what's the point of like actually capturing that? Sorry, what do you mean? Like if the remainder is smaller than like nine times the number of digits, then you can't possibly return to zero. I mean, is there, if k is Well, well, no, here, so remember the problem was, uh, maybe misunderstanding what you're saying, but the problem here is that the actual value of the number has to be divisible by k, right? Not just the sum of digits. That's the second part, the sum of digits has to be divisible by k. But the actual well, value of the number has to be divisible by k. Yeah, sorry? What I mean is, if, if k is greater than the maximum, then it's automatically, it's not divisible by k. Or rather, the sum of the digits isn't going to be divisible by k. Sure, yeah, the sum of the digits can't go bigger than k, right? And that's what I think I said for the last problem, I was saying you can keep it constrained. But that doesn't really matter, because k is often going to be a lot bigger than the max level digits, right? The max level digits is like 90. And k can go up to 10,000, so I don't think it really... Maybe it's interesting... Yes, sorry? What are you saying, though? Like, you could do this for a much bigger k. Like, k is 10 to the 9th or whatever, by just basically ignoring it if k is bigger than 90. Ah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, that's true, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't think of that, yeah. That's true. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. Oh, okay, yeah, in terms of implementation, right? So I, I think that uh, hopefully pretty comfortable with how the, the DP works for it. Um, but there's also the question of setting up the DP, right? So I have that using this other solve function. Um, and the way you would do it is you would literally just call two string on the number um, and then fill in R with the digits of that number. And n would be however long that number is. Right? And you also need to set the dp to negative 1, initialize to negative 1. And the actual value would just be solve 0, 1, 0, 0. Why? Because start at position 0, you start out constrained, and the sum, both types of remainder sums are both 0. Right? So, and then for the actual like input output part, you would call solve uh, b minus solve a minus 1, right? as we discussed before. So, oh, well, like, okay, uh, 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 what you say? Any, can you? Like, I always think just divide by 10, then mods it, or just like, okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, for, uh, in terms of the actual manual based conversion, like, based like, representation, uh, you might need to do that. So, often in the DP problem, you, you might not have base 10, right? They might ask you to do in hexadecimal. Or, I don't know, in binary, or, or base 3, or some other base, at all, uh, that's an arbitrary base that they give the parameter. And in that case, you can't use two string. You'll have to actually just manually do it. 
using the, the mod and divide division, so, like you said. Right. And in that case, you would write it out to R and then flip R around and then stuff like that. Okay? Cool. Next problem. Okay. Next problem is called sum of digits. And it's, do you want the sum of the digits for all numbers from A to B? Uh, again, A to the B here are 10 and 9, so it's really big. Yeah, good. And that's pretty much in general, I'm not sure. So, so you look at all numbers from A to B, you take their sum of the digits, and then you sum that up also. Right, sure. So, so yeah. So, like, you can do the the trick from before, where you calculate from zero to b minus zero to a minus one. That that still works. Yeah. Uh, is there yet some more? I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking like. You do the same is x thing when 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 it's not when like you don't have it x then all the digits after you just multiply like the number by one plus da 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 plus nine or uh, like setting all the other digits. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand. And then uh, can you can you repeat that? I, when, I didn't quite get that. When is equal you? Do, I'm sorry. When yeah, when is equal you have to maintain that it's less than and you do it. Wait, sir, I, I didn't quite catch the first part you said. Like, can, you, can you repeat that first part? Like, like when you have when the digit is smaller, then obviously you just you just, like each each digit is going to be repeated ten to the however many digits there are minus one after that. Um, yeah. Uh, or okay. Um. So yeah, but then what happens when it is equal, right? That, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, when it is equal, you just calculate for all the ones with the next digit, like like we normally do. Right, but but the point is the point I'm trying to get at is when it is equal, you also um, sort of need the sum also, right? You, not sum, you need you need the count, right? You need how many are going to be once it is equal, right? So if you're at some prefix, right, and then you're equal, right, it is equal, um, 
when you sort of maintain that it is equal, right? When you're, when you're maintaining it, you you will you don't know. You can't use the ten to the power thing to get to know how many such numbers there are going to be with that prefix, right? And with what digit? Right? The prefix is fixed if it's equal. The prefix is, but the suffix isn't, right? It's just constrained in some weird way. Use the same principle over and over again to get the unit level. Uh, so you, I, I think you guys are both sort of getting on at the right track. Maybe I don't understand Andrew's thing probably, but uh, let me. I guess I'll just give the solution because you guys are pretty much there, I think. And so the I, idea is that you want to do the same as the example problem we had before, right? Which is counting the numbers in, in that range, right? Um, but instead of just storing, instead of storing the count, we want to store the sum instead, or we care about the sum instead of the count, right? However, we also need the count to update the sum. So what we can do is just use a pair. So use a pair for both the sum and the count. Right? Um, and then to transition, the sum just equals plus equals how many we have of that from that digit, which is a count, which is original DP from the example problem. Right? And then multiply that times um, uh, the digit that we're taking. So let me show you the, the actual code for this. So it looks almost exactly like the example problem, right? except we return a pair instead of a single value. And the pair here represents count for the first value, and the second is the sum. So at the end, we have no digits, so sum is 0, and count is just 1, because we have one number like that. And then when we're updating here, we're updating count and sum. Count just plus equals a count. And sum, right here, plus equals a sum that is contributed from all the suffixes, plus the current digit times how many of our numbers will be in the suffix. Okay. Should I explain any part again of this? Any chance? Uh, because we're taking i the digit i. Let's say we're putting the digit two over here, right? We're putting the digit, the digit two in this current place, right? Um, for the suffix, right? The suffix will contribute some sum, which is current that second here, right? But that single digit two, it won't just contribute the, the value two. It'll contribute two times how many ever numbers, how many ever suffixes use this prefix, right? Oh yeah. yeah. And so as you were saying before, if we're not is equal, then this sort of curve off first is kind of trivial, right? It's just t not trivial, but it's, it's the 10 to the power thing, right? Um, however, otherwise, it's not so obvious. Um, I guess the idea was a little unfair. And also, I was kind of planning to like propagate the count like forward rather than backward. I see. Yeah, so, so this is a sort of problem where instead of the, the predicate is, is trivial, it doesn't exist, it's true, right? So we don't, we don't really need any extra information for that. But the DP state itself here, to calculate F here, is sort of more complicated. Should I do like an example out with this to, to explain why this DP transition state works, or is everyone understand it? I can do an example if you need to. Yeah, okay. Okay. Everyone see that? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. So let's say we've set up some prefix, I don't know, one, two, three. Okay. And let's say A is, const the constraint for A, is, the value for A is one, two, I don't know, three, four, right? Um, one, two, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, then when we set some value here, right? Uh, whatever value we set, let's say we set the value three, right? When we set the value three here, um, 
the value three, this 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 digit three, will contribute for many different times. What can it be? One, two, three, three, zero. It will contribute three, one, right? And it will contribute so on and so forth up to, all the way up to one, two, three, three, nine, right? So this column over here, right? The value three has been contributed nine times or ten times here, right? So to the sum of the digits, to the actual final answer, we want to contribute three times nine, three times ten, thirty, right? And so the way we know that it's contributed nine times is just the number of total rows in this thing, the number of times that we have this digit appear, this number appear, right, with this prefix. Um, but that's just the original DP with the count, and then that's all. That's what happened. Right? As for example, if this was four instead, right? If it was four, it would be constrained, and you'd only go up to zero, one, two, three, four, five. And so that's why we need the DP to tell us how many rows here are there, how many numbers are going to have this prefix. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's keep on going. Okay. Chef and special numbers. Okay. This is a really good problem, I think. Uh, so, uh, we define a k special number, um, is a number that contains k or more digits that is divisible by, okay? So, we look at all the digits that it contains, right, in its actual representation, and we see, is it divisible by that digit? Um, if it is, then we add that to, like, a value k. Okay? So, for, for example, 48 is 2 special, because 4 divides 48, and 8 also divides 48. So, it's 1, 2, 2 special. Um, it, by the way, it's also 0 and 1 special because it says k or more, right? So 0 special because it, it certainly contains more than 0, 0 more digits that it's divisible by. And it contains 1 or more because it contains 4, right? So it's divisible by 4, so it's also 1 special. Um, okay? Everyone understand what k special means? Um, is 44 1 special or 2 special? It, it would be 1 special. It, it's the actual, like, number from 0 to 9 itself not the place value. It, it would not be too special. Yeah. Okay. So, as you may have guessed, the question for the problem is just count the number of k special numbers in the range a to b. Again, a and b are huge, 10 to the 18th, um, and k is the given parameter from 0 to 9. Okay. okay. What do you mean by uh, the trivial case for multiplying by ten? Um, can you can you elaborate on that? I'm not sure I understand. I don't think that's true. Oh no, it is true. Right, because you multiply by ten. You're right. Yeah, that that works. Um, I think like, doesn't that not work for like seventy? Yeah. Wait, do I not? I don't understand. No, because you multiply by ten and you're just adding zero, right? So it's still divisible by seven, or whatever. Okay. Oh wait, yeah. No wait. No. What about like fifty-one? So, what is it, 51 is about 17, that's 3? So you're making it a multiple of 5 now, but it wasn't before. But remember, it's k or more. So, at 48, right, it was 2 special, but it's also 1 special. So if 51 was, I don't know, whatever, whatever special before, or 0 special before, it's still 0 special after you multiply by 10. Right, but now it's 1 special. But it's still 0 special. I it, guess, but like... It's not an either-or thing, so, so... As I said, if like, like a two special number is also one special, it's also zero special. Right, but uh, I'm saying it does change 
like the maximum K that works for That's true, that's true. But, but, he, but he's saying if it works, right? Every time you find a number that works, you just keep on adding zeros. Something like you do, like what we did with k, where it's mod k, except you do mod each digit. Yeah, so yeah, you're certainly towards the right track. So yeah, so think about specifically uh, what's the, all the information you need to calculate the condition. Now, that's what's the one way to start starting place. So first, let's think about what is the actual information we need, right, to calculate the condition, and then let's, and then we can later think about is that small enough to fit within the time limit or constraints or whatever, right? So, so yeah, so just, just maybe you can just like shout out what information you specifically need. To calculate each sort of part of the condition. I guess you would also need a set for like what digit it has, and then you can make that like better memory by just making it like a remainder of negative one. Remainder, okay, if he doesn't have it, okay, that's true. All right, so, so let's think about how big that'll go, right? So, um, let's, let's do the math for that. I don't have calculate. So, let's do that, right? Um, so, uh, as I make sure everyone understands, uh, what, uh, Andrew's saying, which is crazy train. Uh, okay, um, so yeah, so, so what Andrew's saying is that we need to calculate, we need to calculate, calculate the condition, what we need is a divisibility by each digit, and also whether or not that digit um, is inside the number, right? Um, so first off, uh, so if you look at the remainder by each, by each digit, right, uh, the remainder by one will be, there's only one possible thing that doesn't do anything, times two, right? Right? Um, and then we also need, to the nine, right? Because that's the whether or not it's everything's there. This is a, for all possible combinations of having digits, it's two to the nine of them. Because each digit can either be there or not there. So there's two possibilities. So what is that? Uh, so this is going to turn out to be too big because when we take this and then multiply it by twenty, right? It comes that. Um, and then we're going to multiply it by ten because we need to actually do it for each possible digit. This is going to be like some four billion or something. So just just edging on the on the side of too big here, right? So like that, that's what I was thinking of doing, like negative one for when it, when it isn't there or something. So then you it would be like... You can't actually do that though, because um, you still need to keep track of the actual remainder, because what if you get that digit later? Then you would make it the remainder. Right, right, but I understand, but you, you still need to remain, keep track of the remainder. You can't just make a negative one, right? You'll still need to keep track of the remainder. Like negative one would be only if there isn't that digit, and then you would always have that digit after you have it for the first time. No, 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 I'm saying let's say let's say you're at position five or something, right? And you haven't got the digit three yet, so that that thing says negative one, right? Yeah. But now let's say you get that digit three at position five. Then how do you know what its remainder is supposed to be? Because you, you haven't kept track of that. Oh, 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 I, yeah, yeah. But but obviously then you can do the optimization, which is like not doing. Two and four and six. Yeah, so that's the correct optimization um, which you're looking for. And so the sort of critical uh, realization here is that to check the divisibility by multiple numbers, we don't need mod by all those numbers. We just need the mod by their LCM. Uh, does everyone see why this is true? Uh, I can maybe go in depth more on this, but this is. Uh, so, 
Uh, so here's a proof of it. Um, so if you have some number k, right, and we want to check divisibly by k, if we instead do keep instead of keeping mod k, we keep mod a multiple k. Let's say we keep mod uh, two times k, right, or any p times k, right. Um, then if it is divisible by k, uh, it will also be divisible. The mod by p k will also be divisible by k because you can keep on subtracting, if you subtract out multiples of p times k, you're, that's still a multiple k you're subtracting out. Right? Um, as an example, uh, 10 is divisible by 5, right? Um, and, I don't know, that's a bad example. 50 is divisible by 5, right? But if we instead keep track mod 40, let's say, instead of, instead of doing mod 5, Right, which would be zero. If we do mod forty, well, fifty mod forty will be ten, um, and so that is also and ten is also divisible by five, right? So if since we're keeping instead of keeping mod five, if we keep any multiple of five, mod any multiple of five, let's say forty, as I was saying, um, that also gives us the divisible by five. Um, and so when an LCM is, it's the least common multiple. It's a common multiple. It's a multiple of all the digits we care about, all the numbers we care about. So we keep keep mod of this. It'll have all the divisible information for all the numbers we care about. Okay, so, yeah, so. Uh, in this case, the LCM of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is 2, 5, 2, 0. And so this sort of captures all the stuff that Andrew was talking about. You can do the adapter that he was talking about, where he's like, ah, you don't need 2 and 4 because you have 8, right? And stuff like that. Um, so, in, for example, you don't need, I don't know, 9 because you have 3, and stuff like that. That all comes together in the LCM. Because you also only need mod by this. Instead of 1 by times 2 times 2 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7, 8, 9, right? Um, we also need the, the big math to keep track of which digits we have, and that's 5 or 12. And in this case, instead of going to 4 billion, we only go to, let's say, 30 million. And that's small enough. Okay. Um, and so here, here's what the code looks like. So we have this axis for the remainder of mod the LCM, and we have this for the bit mask. Um, and so let me show you the transition first. So when we're transitioning, the mod thing is the exact same from before, where we shift it left by one by one place, uh, by multiplying by 10, we add the digit and then we mod. And the mask is just we keep track of the mask, right? Um, here we're adding digit i to the mask, we're ordering it by 2 to the i, except one sort of caveat here is that we do 2 to the i minus 1, because 0 is never a digit we care about. So that, that's it's 2 to the 9, not 2 to the 10, because we just you know zero, so then we need to sort of move our digits, in index them off by one by subtracting one. Okay. Uh, then here we keep track of this maximal sp uh, specialness in our actual final condition, and so we loop over all digits and we check: oh, is it divisible by that digit? And oh, is it contained that digit? And then we update the maximal special specialness, and then we only take it if that specialness is at least k. This is, uh, I think, a harder problem than we had before, um, it's, but it's also really interesting, I think. It's called spring cleaning, uh, and it asks, how many pairs of numbers, A and B, um, within these bounds, L to R, satisfy A plus B is equal to A's or B? Uh, constraints here are uh, L and R both to the 10 and the 9th. Okay. Uh, this was a chord force problem, I think, from actually around. Um, well, so an example here is that 3 zor 4 is 7, um, and so is 3 plus 4, it's also 7. 
So, so 3 comma 4 would be an example of such a pair. Okay? Does everyone understand a problem statement at least? Sorry, what? Are we counting overflow? Like, what do you mean by overflow? I don't know, like, say you have a 2 bit number, then like 2 plus 2 is 0. You, 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 the problem statement itself always doesn't concern itself with like how many bits the number is, which is up to whatever. It's just up to ten and nine, right? So you assume there's nothing with that. No, no. Uh, there's no overflow, at least in the problem statement. It works for, or I guess even in the problem. Right? I'm not, we even not understand what you're saying, but but it just says you have these big numbers and you do the bitwise or, right? And you do addition and you check whether they're equal. I'm sorry. Are, are you are you saying that as? Are you seeing that as a solution or like as part of the problem statement? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, as a solution. Oh, like, sorry. How, how we done before yeah, on the on the binary numbers, and you you have the equals condition as before. Okay. Or rather, actually, when it's not equal, you return zero, right? So so then you just only keep. Actually, wait. Never mind. Uh, so, I mean, you, you have one, one part, uh, correct, so I'll give that hand out because you, you got that. Um, and that's, nope, that's not, the, never mind, uh, that's the other hand. Uh, you have one hand, which is that we can do um, DP not on base 10 here, but on base 2 instead. Right? Uh, digit DP doesn't have to be on, on decimal yes. bases. Yeah, sorry, what? Yeah, I was going to suggest that if that you accidentally reopen it, oh. uh, you rewrite the addition uh, as, as or plus two times the end. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll give the hand, I guess. So then you find out that the end of the two numbers equal to zero. Yeah. So yeah, if you were came to a bitwise lecture, I think, this this theme came up quite more than a couple times, I think. I mean, that's that the addition of two numbers, sum of two numbers, is there's or plus the end, the end. And, and maybe that's what Andrew meant with the overflow slightly, where if, if you have this carry bit, right? The end represents the carry bit. It should be two times it, yeah, you're right. Uh, my bad. Uh, yeah, it should be two times the end, sorry. But, but this is the, the sort of the carry bit if the two are equal, right? Um, and so if this has to be equal, we need their end to be zero, right? And so what that means is that... Yeah, wait. Yeah. Can, can you like? Can, sorry, I, I was thinking like you do a base four DP actually. Base four DP. Uh, the actual final answer maybe look can maybe is equivalent to something like that. That, that might work actually. I'm, I'm not sure how it would how it would look though. I don't think so, but you could, you might be able to make it work with the base four DP. Um, yeah, yeah. And back with this, just so you can get the hint, just everyone understand this hint is that uh, we need their end to be zero, right? And what that means is that they can't be in any single bit position. Both A and B can't have that bit set. They can't both be one at that position, right? Either one is zero, the other one is zero, or both are zero, because otherwise we'll have overflow, like Andrew was saying, with carry. Which screws up this and is already equal,
uh, there are there are like a multiple steps here to, from from this position to the actual answer. So feel free to, to shout out any like small observations or ideas you have on how the DP should work. Ah, oh, yeah. Right, so the original statement is we have we like count pairs of numbers in this range where the zor is equal to the sum. And, and so what we saw with the hint is that uh, this that, that that's equivalent to saying we want the and to be zero. you have two numbers this time instead of one number in your dp and you build them one digit at a time if you go from one dp state to the next you do like plus zero one and then plus one zero like the second digit. yeah uh, that's that's uh, it, yeah that, that's exactly correct um we we instead of keeping track of one number here we keep track of prefixes for two numbers the information for both numbers um, and we just and since we only care about the relationship at the same digit, right? Yeah. They only interact at the same digit, we can just do them one digit at a time, right? Yeah. So you you know what? That, that's like where, that's like what my base four idea was, but then like obviously you can't like yeah. actually get the numbers that easily. Because I was, I was thinking like you base four just one number instead of two, but there's no reason to do that. Right. Yeah. So, so, this, so this is half of it, right? We do both of them simultaneously because they only interact at the same digit. Um, however, there's still a. Uh, just... What do you mean half the sum for everything less than k digits? What sum are you referring to? The K minus two. Uh, if you do that, right? I'm not even sure if that's true, but if that's true, right? You're saying this K minus one, like sort of unconstrained numbers. What happens when you set the set the first digit to like sort of be one or something, or to be zero? Whatever you set the first digit, right? And now you're looking at all the K minus one digit answers, right? Like like all, all the K digit answers. Um, where you've set the first one not to be zero, so it's not it's the, the, the 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 numbers that are not k minus one digit long. Then uh, how do you even count that? That's not a constant size. That's still really really big, right? Constraints like one constraint on the first number and then one constraint on the second number, and you do like RR minus RL minus LR or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe I, I, I you get that inclusion exclusion type stuff to work, um, but it turns out you don't even need to do anything that smart. Um, so you basically have the full answer now. Um, so first thing is we don't need to do base ten, we need to base two because we'll look at that. Um, next thing is that. Uh, 
instead of doing this sort of in, uh, answer b minus n like low, right? Like high minus low, um, which sort of does not work as nicely with two numbers. Maybe you can do inclusion exclusion for that. I'm not sure. But instead of doing that, we can just keep upper and lower constraints. So in our original uh, digit DP formulation, we just had the upper constraint, right? Well, we can do the exact same thing for the lower constraint, the lower side. So we can say, oh, uh, have I gone above this digit in the, in the, in the bottom, right? Uh, in, in A, right? Um, and so if I have, uh, then I can just do whatever I want as, as long as I'm not hitting the upper constraint. But if I haven't, then I can't go below the lower constraint again. So it's, it's the same thing, so if we just do the symmetric thing for the bottom. Thing. Um, and then we can do this for both numbers, like you were saying. So we actually end up having four constraints. Low A, high A, low B, and high B. And then at any given position, we just check all possible combinations and see which ones satisfy our conditions. Okay, so here's, it, it comes out, I'm gonna walk, it kinda looks kinda really, really messy, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So, uh, this thing is the position, uh, which position we're at. And then these are our four constraints. So this is the lower constraint for one and the higher constraint for one, for, for A, I guess, and it's the lower constraint for B and the higher constraint for B, right? Um, and so here, uh, if we reach the end, then we're good. We just take that number. Uh, and then if we haven't, right, we try... Yeah. Sorry, what? Uh, I can't hear you. Uh. Oh, oh, oh. I can explain the part again if you're confused. Sure. You're like, why are there two separate? Uh, I'll, I'll just disappear. Are uh, you talking about, oh, you're talking about like, down, that more down in the code? Or? No, no, I was just wondering about like the, the lower constraint again. Like, why are there two lower constraints and why are there two upper constraints? Because there's two numbers, right? We have the number A and the number B. So A and B are sort of like built independently. Not, not independently, they, they do interact like that they can't be the same at any given position. But in terms of their constraints, oh, they sort of like. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, 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 yeah. Maybe if other people explain for other people, I'm going to explain that again. Um, if, uh, we can have like a situation where A is a constraint below, right? Because it hasn't gone high enough to, to break free of that constraint where B isn't constrained below, or maybe B is also constrained above, right? And so we can have any sort of combination of these, these sort of ideas. Uh, and maybe it's constrained both below and above, right? You can have that sort of thing, where it's just com continuously matching it. Um, one can be constrained below and above, the other can be constrained some other way, and you just have any sort of combination of that. Yeah. Okay. So here we're counting. So we, we try all possible digits for both of them. So for for, for number one, for A, we try the bit, the bit goes from 0 to 1, there's only two possible for each bit, right? There's 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 here. So for, for the bit that goes to A and the bit that goes to B. Um, and so this is the sort of thing from the problem itself, right? At any given position, the bits themselves cannot be equal, right? So we, not equal, sorry, that's not correct. They both can't be set. So if they're both set, then we don't do that, right? We can't, we do not allow both bits to be set at once. Uh, then this is just the c checking of these four constraints over here, right? So for, maybe this will uh, clear things up. So if we're, if A is bounded below, right? Um, and the lower bound is one, but our current bit is zero, then we've sort of gone below our lower constraint and we're saying that we are constrained, constrained. So we don't allow that. Similarly, we do the same thing for B. So we say B is bounded below, um, and our current thing is 1, and this is 0, so we've gone below our bound, and we're bounded below, then we continue. Now, same thing here. So we're bounded above, and we've gone above the bound by taking 1 when it's actually 0, and same thing for A and B here, and we continue. Everyone understand how these constraints are working? And how the checks for the constraints are working? I could have written this with a ternary like I did before. Like for the other problems, right? I, I use a ternary, um, like here, right? For the, for the constraints. 
Uh, I just think it would look more messy here if I use a ternary for this sort of thing because there would be four ternaries in the for loop, so I think that would be more messy. But it's the exact same thing uh, as those ternaries. It's just four if statements instead. It just stops you from going below the, the bound given by the, the, the left number or the right number, um, below or above, um, if you are constrained, but respectively, if the numbers are constrained. Uh, now, if we can take these digits, right, then we move the number forward, and then we update the constraints. So if, we're, if, a, if A has to be constrained below, it had to be already be constrained below, and you had to be matching the current constraint. Same thing here. If, we're, if A is constrained above, you had to constrain above in the past, um, and you currently match the current position, and so on. Any questions on this? And this is kind of confusing. Uh, okay, uh, that's it then, I guess. No, no, any questions? So. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, these slides are uh, up on our folder. And these are the problems that we did in this lecture. Um, and this link over here has a lot more to do problems for you guys to do. Um, as you, this is like a blog on GDP, and you scroll the bottom, it's like a ton of problems for you to do. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, guys, I guess. Bye.